Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 228 of Catfish on Ice. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, thank you so much. Please hit subscribe below. This is your host, Chad Minton. We're gearing up for the playoffs. The Predators have officially clinched their 16th playoff berth in their franchise's history. They had to do it in losing fashion by taking the dreaded loser point, overtime point to the Winnipeg Jets. But it sets us up perfectly because we got an awesome guest joining us, Brian Finlayson, co-host of Level Flight Podcast. We're doing a collaboration here to get ready for the playoffs. It's a fellow podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. First of all, Brian, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. It is a beautiful day outside, and I'm gearing up to uh, watch uh, another, um, you know, should be a fantastic matchup between Central Division opponents tonight as the Jets take on the Stars. Oh, the schedule makers did it beautifully for you guys to have to, oh. you got to play Preds, Stars, and Avs. Luckily, you're kind of locked into your spot. We're about to really talk about it. First, first thing we're going to do with Brian joining us today is we are going to look back at Tuesday, that epic meeting between the Preds and the Jets. It was uh, the two teams end up splitting the season series 2 2 separated by only one goal over those four games. So that is pretty incredible stuff there. Um, very unlikely. I think it's almost impossible that the Preds and the Jets will meet in the first round. But I would love to at least talk about that game with Brian from his perspective. And a tremendous performance from Connor Hellebuck, of course. So we're going to break down that game, really what it meant for both teams. Also, what we're going to look ahead to each of our teams is playoff hopes and chances where we see – each of our teams going, both the teams we cover and the outsider perspective. When to get into that, it's going to talk about some other X factors for uh, both teams. Want to look back at the 2018 series between the Jets and the Predators in the second round because that was the last time the Predators made it past the first round. We're talking about two franchises that have not had a ton of playoff success in their. Um, history, of course, the Jets were formerly the Atlanta Thrashers, so we're going to get into that. That'll be a lot of fun. But first, we're going to give the floor to Brian. What what did that game mean to you? How much different was that game maybe f from the perspective of the Jets and the perspective of the Predators? Of course, the Predators were still trying to get a playoff spot locked up. The Jets are pretty much locked in in that third-place position. What did you get out of that game from the Jets' perspective? Uh, from the Jets' perspective, uh, I think, I mean, we didn't need the reinforcement of the idea, but it was the fact that regardless of how you play, you have a chance when Connor Hellebuck's in the crease. Um, and, you know, I mentioned this on the last episode of our show where uh, I think at one point the shots, I think, were 44 18. Um, and, you know, that was just after uh, things got knotted up at three. But no, it was. It was a very interesting one because the Jets were incredibly opportunistic in the first period. Um, you see what makes them successful when things are really clicking, where uh, you know that first goal with Gabe Velarde between the legs, roofed it over Saros. Um, but then you have things like you know Tyler Toffoli being an impact guy, which they acquired him to do so. Um, Dylan DeMello, who has scored probably... I think five goals in his last three seasons. Um, he was given the ability to walk right into the slot and rip it. Uh, so using your chances to convert is terrific, but that only matters if you can continue to sort of press. And uh, a lot of what happened after that was them getting caved at five on five. Um, a lot of, a lot of shots against a lot of chances against, um, obviously it was three, one jets at one point ended up going over time for three. Um, a lot of frustration I know from jets fans, because there's been a lot of deployment questions. Um, mm -hmm. top line has changed. And I mean, I say changed, but it's essentially just flip flopping one, one or two guys. Um, but it, it matters a lot to the success of this team. And then obviously they come out with the win, which is huge for that battle for, uh, the second spot in the division, because, you get that, you get home ice, and you get the you know the line matching and that sort of thing. Um, so the win is huge, but with how things shook out, it was hard to be happy about it from a Jets perspective. Mm, gotcha. Brian Finlayson, co-host of Level Flight Podcast, covering the Winnipeg Jets. A little collaboration we got going on here to get ready for both of our teams. Playoff runs to see what happens here. So yeah, I agree with a lot of that stuff. I saw... 
So the Preds came out definitely very too lackadaisical with puck possession. I mean, you cannot do that against a team like the Jets and or any team for that matter, but definitely playoff caliber teams like the Jets. And it, it came back and bit them. A lot of Preds fans were dogging on Soros, pull Soros, get him out of there. And it's like, come on, guys. He's getting no help from 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 his line mates who are supposed to be protecting the crease and protect him. But as the game settled down, I definitely saw a little bit more desperation out of the Predators because even though their playoff chances were like 99.9% chance, even if they lost that game, I saw desperation and it was it was definitely refreshing to see them storm back in that third period. But let me just say this. I don't think the Jets are getting nearly enough love for their uh, playoff chances. They're definitely getting overshadowed by our two other Central Division counterparts that are in the playoffs, the Stars and the Avs. But just exhibit A, as you just mentioned, Brian, Connor Hellebuck was just so frustrating from a Predators perspective. But, I mean, it's nothing new to me. The guy has just been doing this for a while now. He's the workhorse, just like Saros has been. Two very different style goalies, but equally workhorses for their teams. Um, so I got to ask you, uh, what realistically speaking, do you feel like this Jets team has the full ingredients to um, to make a run at the Stanley Cup final? Um, I mean, I, I feel like I have to preface it where they have they have the ingredients, a hundred percent. But I think it's how you use them that's going to be the you know defining factor as to whether or not this team is a Stanley Cup contender, or if they're a team that is, has the potential of being you know bounced out in the first two rounds. Um, you know, I mean, for example, late last game, um, coincidentally, right when uh, the goals actually started coming for the Preds, um, Rick Bonus, the head coach, uh, he went back to his quote unquote old faithful because uh, he saw that the the other top line was struggling. And that is uh, the top line of Kyle Connor, uh, Kyle Connor, Mark Shifley and Gabriel Velarde. Um, they've played almost 160 minutes together this year, and they have very rarely won their minutes. They have been outchanced. They have been outshot. They've been outscored. Um, and we're seeing that despite all that, the coaching staff trusts them to be the top line. Um, I don't trust that line being able to make as big of a difference in a playoff environment. Like I'm just, I mean, at this point it seems almost like confirmed that they're playing the avalanche in the first round. Uh, I can only assume you're putting your top line up against their top line. And I worry because of the defensive struggles they've had, um, what Nathan McKinnon is going to do that line. Like it feels like a field day for him, but I feel like if they're deployed properly, like at their best, the Jets had a top line of Nikolai Ehlers, Mark Scheifele, and Gabe Velarde. And then they recently were running a great second line that uh, had Kyle Connor down there with Sean Monaghan, their other uh, deadline acquisition, and then Cole Perfetti, uh, who is the Jets' first-round pick from a few years back, 22-year-old. He's very skilled offensively, but he has drawn the ire of the coaching staff. Uh, he's been in and out of the lineup, but they finally gave him a shot to show up in the top six that line was playing great they had one i mean everyone struggled uh you know especially like in terms of what they were giving up against uh the preds on tuesday there um but for some reason some guys dealt more with that they swapped the lines perfetti actually is not in the lineup tonight against dallas um and i think that being too reactionary and taking that top line and you know putting it back to what wasn't working uh compared to what I mean, they've won, they've won four straight games with the lineup they started. Um, and they had lost six straight prior to that with the lineup that they're going back to. So I'm not quite sure I trust the lineup to pull it off in the playoffs. But then you you got Connor Hellebuck, who could steal you a game or two, which keeps you in it. So I think they've got the ingredients. They just have to put them together properly. <clears throat> now, we, we, me and my co-host, Max Reamberg, we have uh, debated this exact topic um, in previous episodes. I want to get your thoughts from the Jets' perspective. Who would you rather face in the first round the avalanche or the stars who do you think you match up better against i definitely think the avalanche and i know it's weird saying that against a guy like nate mckinnon who is my heart trophy pick um you know seeing what he did against the wild the other night it was like watching 
you know, someone going up against, you know, peewee hockey players, just how fast mm-hmm. he was going around guys. But I think I, I don't trust them as much against Dallas's style and just overall makeup of their team. Uh, Dallas has the chance to sweep the Jets in the season series tonight if they, uh, they manage to pull that off. Um, but Colorado, if you look at their depth chart, they are not nearly as deep a team. Uh, they rely a lot on their top line for their offense and their top defensive pairing, obviously, with Kale mm-hmm. McCarr and uh, Devon Taves. Um, but you look at the rest of their lineup, where obviously they did acquire Casey Middlestat to play that second line role, but you've got you know Zach Parisi playing on your third line uh, after not even starting the year on a team. You've got uh, you know Andrew Cogliano still down there, so you've got a lot of older, a little bit slower guys. Uh, they're not going to score uh, as much as you know another third line would, um, and I mean, let's be honest, Alexander Georgiev and Net hasn't been exactly the most steady for them either. So I do think that the top lines, um, Colorado wins that battle, but the rest of the team, if they're deployed properly, I, I like the Jets' chances to outscore their other lines. Um, and they can make up for anything that possibly goes wrong against the top line with McKinnon. Um, and then obviously I love the goaltending. Um, that, that's the, the matchup there is clearly in the Jets' favor um, because I don't know how Colorado can go into a series and totally definitively say, oh, yes, Georgiev's going to lock it down. And that's the same argument I made with my co-host as well. He said he would much rather face Dallas. Um, I said I'd, I'd re- I didn't say I'd much rather face. I mean, you're picking your poison either way. But yeah. I, I, I kind of I sided with you uh, as well, Brian. Same reasons. I don't trust Alexander Gorgiev uh, to not just possibly lose a game or two for the Avs, where the Avs would come out and you know have a good game. And then, as you just alluded to, I do think Colorado is much more top heavy than Dallas. Dallas's depth scares scares me and it really leads me to believe that they can definitely win a Stanley Cup this year with with that kind of depth. I think they're extremely well coached. They're really good on special teams. They're a very disciplined team. You're going to have to go out and take it from a team like Dallas. They're not going to give it to you. They're not going to make very many mistakes. Uh whereas Colorado, you know, they're going to pretty much have to lean on their top two lines and Cal McCarr to just go out there and just have a, a playoff run for the ages. Um, I don't think they're as good as they were the year they won the Stanley cup. Uh, I, I just don't think they're quite that good, but either way you're picking your poison. It's going to be tough, but let's look at it. The overall uh, Western conference landscape. And first Brian, a uh, host of level flight podcast covering the Winnipeg jets. Give me your outsider perspective. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Trust me. <laughs> Give me your outsider perspective on w- w- the season the Predators have had because the overall, you know, they're kind of like the flavor of the month right now around the NHL when you have an 18-game point streak, that'll happen. Um, they're getting a lot of love. Uh, they're, they're, there's even some people out there saying, oh, watch out for this Preds team. They, they're they going to be a, a force in the first round to deal with. They're going to be a headache, all this stuff. So, are you buying the Kool-Aid or do you think the Predators maybe peak too soon? They're a fun story, but they're probably just a little ahead of schedule and they're going to get uh, exposed in the playoffs. What do you think, man? Um, I, I mean, I feel like it's a bit of both because when there's a level of extremes like that, it's hard to sort of pull any sort of negatives out of a, an 18 game, you know, point streak, but it's also, you know, hard to judge them right after that and say, this is a completely different team that you've just seen for the last 18 games. And so I feel like, I mean, the the Stanley Cup playoffs are to an effect kind of random at times because a couple weird goals, uh, you know, some bad, you know, suspect penalty calls leading to some, you know, timely power plays. Something like that can happen that can change a whole series. And I think that the Preds are well equipped to be opportunistic. I don't think necessarily that they're going to be viewed as, uh, you know, a favorite by any means in what either, whether they play, uh, it looks like it's probably going to be Vancouver, um, I would think. Um, but I, I mean, I actually, I don't mind the Preds chances against the Canucks. I feel like the Canucks have some holes. There's still some questions about Thatcher Demko um, because he has been out for Vancouver for the last while. He will probably be back for the first round, but otherwise your two goalies in Vancouver are 
a little bit of a question mark. But I feel like the Preds have the tools to be a team that could, say, upset a Vancouver. Um, because regardless of you know what happens in terms of the actual amount of goals he gives up, Yus Soros is going to give you a chance to win most nights. And unless you turn it into a firing range against him, he's usually sound enough that you're going to get that chance. Um, and I think that with Soros and net, and we've seen what happens when things click up front uh, for, you know, offensively for the Preds, it's, it's, it has the makings of a team that could make a surprise run, at least through the first round. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it does have to be, how much can go right for them for them to unseat it versus how much can go wrong to make it go a very quick exit. Yes, I agree with all of that. I really do. Um, so here's why I am very cautiously optimistic about the Predators being able to do something similar to what they did in 2016-17 when they, when they made that magical run to the cup final. They um, they do have lines one through four that are pretty set. There's not a lot of fluidity going on right now. I mean, Andrew Burnett's pretty much kept his lines consistent. And the team has also been very fortunate on the injury front. For the most part, they did go through a rash of injuries with their defensemen there for a little bit. But overall, this team has been jailing for a while. The chemistry is there. Lines one through four, there's not a huge drop-off. It their top line with Ryan O'Reilly and Philip Forsberg and Gus Nyquist, I'll put them up against almost any top line in the playoffs. I'm not saying they're the most elite, but productivity-wise and how much they've played together is, I think, second most ice time in the league among top lines, only behind um, the New York Rangers' top line. So they've played all this time together. That's going to do wonders for a playoff series. Ryan, You've got the playoff pedigree with Ryan O'Reilly – Luke Shen, Gus Nyquist, you got a lot of guys who've got playoff battle-tested experience. My biggest thing that I am really, really worried about with this Preds team is are they going to be able to live up to that elite level of special teams play? Their power play has been very streaky, very much of a roller coaster, and their penalty kill is among some of the worst in the league. They're going to take penalties with how physical they play, and I'm really, really nervous about the Preds having to defend any of these teams' as power play in a seven game series. That's what worries me about the Predators being able to win at least one playoff series is, are they going to be able to live up to the special teams challenge? How are the jets looking on, on in terms of special teams? Do you think they're, uh, they've got a pretty good setup right now or similar concerns? Uh, I mean, the streakiness is of similar concern for me. I mean, the, their penalty kill has been awful for a while. Um, they had that stretch uh, in like November, December where they went, 30 some odd games allowing three goals or less. And that definitely, they weren't taking many penalties during that time. So the, uh, the penalty kill wasn't really viewed as an issue then. Um, they're sitting bottom half of the league right now in their, their penalty kill, their power play when it doesn't have Gabe Velarde, uh is effectively, it feels like a penalty kill. Like it, it, it like they weren't, I, there was points where I was joking where I'm like, can we institute a rule where the Jets can decline a penalty because it felt like <laughs> yeah. they were like football. Yeah. Like football. It was, it just felt like a waste of time. Um, my issue with their power plays, if they're not running it through Gabriel Velarde down near the net. Um, so it forces teams to kind of move up and down. Um, their other default system is running it around the sort of umbrella system around the two guys on the half wall and then up through the defenseman at the point, which makes it very easy to defend. Uh, if they do the the ladder there with the, um, the umbrella format, they will get shut down very quickly uh, against almost anyone. Um, but if they do actually keep up what they're, successful at which is working down low and then opening guys up by creating that north south movement i think that at the very least they'll be like average which i think for the team based on how they can play at five on five is enough for them um but it's just do they do it mm. all right so yeah we're kind of breaking down strengths and weaknesses of both the preds and the jets let me just give you my my thoughts from an outsider perspective on the jets they have um they've been impressive to me i, I thought they might have a drop off this year a little bit but um the fact that they have just remained a very consistent and steady team and they just keep proving a lot of people wrong when it comes to just staying very relevant to 
at the top of that of a very very difficult and tough division. Um, I've never been a big Rick Bonus guy. I got to be honest, but the guy is been around for a long time, and he is a um, he's a guy who knows how to get teams at least playoff ready. And once you get in, anything can happen. Uh, I got to say, I don't have nearly any type of high level of disdain for the Jets as I do other franchises that are in the playoffs this year. So you're not going to see any um, any vitriol from me towards the Jets unless it's uh, obviously Jets Preds, which would be really cool, which <laughs> kind of brings me to my uh, to my final question here with uh, Brian uh, Finlayson, co-host of the Level Flight Podcast. It's been a lot of fun doing this and um, – get ready for the playoffs here uh, in, let's see, it's nine days. April 20th is when the Stanley Cup playoffs start, so we're getting ready for it. So, last time, the Preds and the Jets have only played each other once in the playoffs, and it was that epic seven-game series in 2018. I still remember it like it was yesterday because that was kind of the beginning of the downward spiral for this Predators franchise when it comes to that Stanley Cup window being open. It was not open for very long, let's put it that way. But um, that one hurt because it went seven games. It was Pecorine's kind of farewell um, series for the franchise. Um, the Jets were just really, really good that year, obviously. And um, I want to ask you, Brian, what are your some some of your biggest memories from that from that seven game series? I mean, one that sticks out to me is that game three in Winnipeg where. Um, Jets go down three nothing and then storm back Ugh. um on the back yeah. of uh I mean largely that storming back was thanks to Dustin Bufflin, who uh I know Jets fans miss dearly and his impact that he had uh on the ice was almost immeasurable. Um but yeah, they stormed back, tied it up at three, went ahead late in the second, uh, and then ended up uh ended up getting tied and then it, it they went ahead, I think, with four minutes left. Uh, in the third there, uh, but on a Blake Wheeler goal. Um, so two, like, that's the thing you, you look back and obviously now it looks like it was, it's so far away, but you think about some of the, the jets key guys at that point and who is still here. And, but the, the biggest role player in that game was Dustin Bufflin and Blake Wheeler, two guys who are no longer with the organization, but will forever sort of live in infamy here. Um, like I remember that clearly. And I remember I was, uh, watching that game seven, and having not ever experienced a game seven uh, as a Jets fan yet, because they'd only made the playoffs uh, like once before that mm -hmm. in 2015 when they got swept out by the, by the ducks. So this was, it was a whole other form of intensity that I hadn't experienced as, you know, a fan in the city. Um, but seeing the, you know, the early goal from, you know, Paul Stastny to put them up the deadline acquisition that year, but also having the ability to sort of, you know, the timely goals and shutting things down and Connor Hellebuck being Connor Hellebuck, like that, that series to me, it sticks out very, you know, there's very good thoughts about that because the next series was so frustrating against Vegas where they ended up losing um, because it felt like they got goalied and they could have won the cup that year, but because of mm -hmm. Marc-Andre Fleury, they didn't. They so, were definitely good enough to win the cup that year. hundred percent. Like it, it was so, it was so nice to see that, that level of play. And I think the peak of that was that Pred series because there was no stopping. Them. Like it felt like they, they were bound and determined to win that series, no matter what it took. That was definitely the Jets launching point um, for them as a, uh, as a franchise coming from being the Atlanta Thrashers to the Winnipeg Jets. Um, and, 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 you know, looking at your playoff history, you've only missed the playoffs once since then so that's in a pretty impressive stretch run there whereas for the predators they've made the playoffs a few times but been first round exits um but both both franchises are if you count all the way back to the thrashers both franchises are still relatively young in their nhl history and they're just hungry to give their fan bases um their first stanley cup you know i mean i know the I, this is kind of something I would want to ask you about. So a lot of Winnipeg Jets fans, they were fans of the original Winnipeg Jets. Did they come over and adopt the new Winnipeg Jets when they became the Thrashers to the Jets? Or are there a lot of old school Jets fans who didn't adopt the new Winnipeg Jets? What, what would you say? Like, how does that work? 
Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting because uh, I feel like there's a large segment of the fan base that was sort of bored and raised after the initial, uh, you know, uh, reiteration of the Jets um, left in 96. So obviously they had to kind of pick their own team growing up before they came back. Personally, I so I, I was born in 97, so I missed it by one year. Uh, and then I actually grew up an Ottawa Senators fan. Um, and okay. so I had to choose a team because I didn't have anyone else. A lot of Jets fans who were, uh, you know, fans of the initial Jets 1.0, um, they a lot, a lot of them held, held a lot of sort of frustration um, for a while. Um, they still have their old rivalries that even if it's not really that big of a rivalry now, like I know like my parents absolutely hate the Oilers and the Flames because of all those years uh, where, you know, Gretzky and all them were ravaging the Jets in the playoffs, or they would come up against Mike Vernon in the Flames and never be able to make it that far. But I know a lot of them adopted different teams for a while. So I think that's why when other teams, especially original six teams, I know a lot of fans that grew up Leaf fans when the Jets left. Um, okay. But I do feel like unless those teams are playing those respective teams, uh, anyone who was the 1.0 fan has hopped on board. So yeah. it's it's not something where it's like they left and then came back and they lost that group. It, everyone was waiting for it. They they, just, they really wanted that team to come back. And they, I don't think there was any you know doubt that they were going to be the Jets. Um, and I know that there's also a large portion of the fan base who uh, refuses to acknowledge the the Thrashers records because it doesn't feel right to them. Mm -hmm. um, because I know there's a lot of times where you'll see like Ilya Kovalchuk's name pop up mm -hmm. in the record books, and then people will get angry about that, and they'll <laughs> you know point to the you know the Solani days, uh, you know Dale Howarchuk, um, you know the legend of him in this city. Uh, it it matters a lot to people, and I feel like people have hung on to that a lot, and you know, the more successful this team is over a long period of time, it feels like a bit of a melding of those, those fan bases, but there's definitely still, you can tell the people who were massive fans before and those who never had that opportunity. Yeah. Very interesting. And you know, it's something you don't see in sports very often, but we could have a similar situation unfolding here with this uh, latest breaking news of, of um, the coyotes relocating to Salt Lake city, which is just, so weird. We'll see how that works out, but um, <laughs> but there's always that potential that the NHL expands to 34 teams, and they put it, they stick another team in Arizona because you know the NHL says they're committed to keeping a team in Arizona. So just that could happen down the road where a new Coyotes 2.0 is created, kind of like the Jets 2.0. But uh, yep. Brian, this has been really fun, man. Uh, best of luck to your Winnipeg Jets. This has been awesome really breaking down um, all of your knowledge about the Jets and the playoffs coming up. Really appreciate it, man. Yo, thank you for having me. And, and you know, as you said to me, best of luck for uh, you and the Preds. Um, it's sure to be a, it's set up to be a really good first round. So I'm just looking forward to a lot of great hockey. Yeah, I feel like I'm being prisoner of the moment here, but because every year I feel like the playoffs are kind of up for grabs and it's kind of um, who knows, hard to predict, but it really feels like this first this year's first round, both conferences are going to be oh, yeah. just um, it's going to be really hard to predict and it's going to be really fun. So uh, it's been Brian Finlayson, co-host of the Level Flight podcast. Let me tell you how to follow the Level Flight podcast on Twitter X at Level Flight WPG. Also, you can follow Brian at W at YWG Brian. Go give them all a follow and his co-host, part of the Hockey Podcast Network. This collaboration has been awesome. Thank you for listening to episode 228 of Catfish on Ice with Chad Minton. We will, we're will looking to do more collaborations with some of our other Central Division podcasts in the future, so stay tuned for that. Until then, everyone have a great rest of your day.